All right, I think we're going to get going. So hello and welcome to this Happy or Not holiday season webinar. We're very happy to see you all here. Thank you so much for joining. I'm Nilo Ferpirainen, the Head of Customer Training and Enablement at Happy or Not, and I'm your host for today's session. You might have seen our smiley feedback terminals around airports and retail locations across the globe. We help businesses track the customer experiences and optimize operations through relevant in-moment feedback. Let's have a look at our wonderful speakers today. We're delighted to have Deanne Gatt Campbell, the Head of Retail Strategy and Insights from AAJ G Consulting Group joining us. Thanks, Deanne. Thank and you. of course, our experts from Happy or Not. So Scott Erickson, mm -hmm. VP Global Partnerships and Alliances, as well as Michael Bradford, Head of Operations Americas. Thank you all for joining. Here's what we'll cover in today's webinar. We'll start with key industry trends and realities, then talk about the changes to the shopper journey. What are some of the biggest challenges and opportunities? And lastly, we happily answer any questions you might have. Um, you can write your questions to the chat at any point and we'll come back to them at the end. So that works too. This webinar is recorded and we'll send the recording as well as the material to all after the weekend. So look out for that early next week. And if we're not able to answer your question at this moment, we'll also make sure to include that uh, and the answer in the material. Let's start with key industry trends and realities. You're welcome to start, Deanne. Oh, thank you so much, Nilo. I'm excited about this subject because how a company performs over the holidays is such a great way to gauge the health of both the consumer and the retailer. I mean, retailers earn as much as a third of their total annual revenue during the holidays. So a good holiday can reverse a bad year and vice versa. Small businesses are obviously going to be the most vulnerable at this time, but holiday earnings can also impact stock price and even company valuation for the big retailers. So it's it's a very precarious time for the entire industry, really. Um, holiday results are going to show how well a retailer's merchandising strategies are working or not working. Uh, I mean, products sold in stores over the holidays typically have to be acquired by the retailer as early as January or February. So your holiday results are gonna be a great indicator of whether you are accessing the right data and using it effectively. And of course, holiday spending is such a strong snapshot of how the consumer is actually doing. Um, the spend save cycle for consumers is reactive, not proactive. We tend to spend until we don't have it rather than hang on to it. So weak holiday sales are a sign that consumers have depleted a lot of their savings and they're heading into some concerning times. Holiday results also show us what consumers are expecting for the next three to six months. So if your sales are down during the holiday season, then it's a big indicator that you need to jump on making some adjustments for next year. And as far as trends go, there are some very interesting factors in play I'm finding this year that are going to impact holiday spending. Timing is one. Timing is continuing to move earlier and earlier in the year. This year, it's in ludicrous territory. I saw my first Halloween item in stores July 1st, and I've been seeing Christmas decorations since the 4th of July. I mean, I get it. Inflation is making retailers nervous, but it's causing problems. Uh, most shoppers don't plan quite that far ahead. And when you get into July, it's hitting up against back to school spending. So by starting too soon, you're not really expanding and increasing your holiday sales, you're simply pulling Q4 revenue into Q3. Plus you're giving consumers buying fatigue by the time Thanksgiving hits. And most importantly, by disconnecting a holiday purchase from the holiday spirit, consumers are gonna feel much more transactional about their choices and the price point they're willing to pay for those choices. And that brings me to discounts. 
discounts are really going to dominate this year, so much so that they're going to guide consumers on where they buy. Um, past couple of years, retailers have built up a lot of excess inventory because of COVID. They've been using discounts quite liberally to try and recover. But that's effectively trained consumers to wait for a discount before they buy. Now, this year, retailers were really hoping to hold off on discounts until much deeper in the holiday season so they could hold on to more of their profit margin. But Amazon has gone and kind of ruined that by announcing another prime sale in October. So consumers who are already very sensitized now to looking out for a discount are going to expect most retailers to follow suit. And another factor in play is competition. And this is gonna impact even Amazon. So retailers this year are going to have to deal with very, very strong competition from some new online and offline companies like Shein and Timu. I bought a shirt from Timu for $1.98 and it's a good shirt, it's, it's very wearable. <laughs> It's going to be hard for even Amazon to compete with that kind of price point. Also, secondhand products, they're now legitimate for gifting. Uh, it's, it's legitimate to gift secondhand product for the holidays. So companies like Poshmark and ThreadUp, they're going to take a, a piece of that very finite holiday pie from the retail um, industry. And the economy is, uh, there's a lot of economic uncertainty this year, but it's a very strange year. So consumers have become pretty good at adapting to change quickly. Last year was a good year for retail sales. We had a decent year for back to school this year. And it appears we're gonna be avoiding a recession. All of that is good news. But consumers are worried about next year, what's coming with inflation, with elections in the US, um, the cost of living, groceries, housing, gas, they're at a 20 year high right now. And there are some big realities coming up. Consumer credit card is at a $1 trillion all time high and student loan repayments are gonna be starting up again in October. So consumers are really starting to feel some concern, and they're already showing a reduced desire to buy big ticket items. And uh, they're starting to shift some of their spending away from products onto experiences. And this is gonna mean um, things like gift cards for restaurants, concerts, movies, those are gonna be very hot items this Christmas. But that's not necessarily helpful for the retail industry. So, um, on top of these trends, of course, retailers are having to deal with changes to how a consumer shops, um, not just what they buy, but how they buy it. And one of the biggest changes is AI, artificial intelligence. AI is already changing how consumers find products to buy and nowhere is this showing up more than with gift giving. So in the past, um, if I were to buy a gift for my niece, teenage teenage niece, I would start that search. I would go on to a search engine like Google. I, I would ask for you know, top 10 items for a teenage girl. I'd get a list brought up of several lists I could click on. There would be ads served up to me on the side and some of those clickable links would lead me directly to retailer websites. So that would be very convenient and I'd have high visibility to the actual source of where to buy these gifts. Now with AI, I can go into ChatGPT or Bard and ask a very customized question. I need a gift for a 15-year-old girl who likes to play Fortnite and she loved the Barbie movie. Her favorite color is green. She wants to be an astronaut. And AI is going to serve me up some very specific recommendations without links back to retailers and without ads. So this kind of search is really going to put a lot more power in the hands of consumers to shop for products by price rather than by brand or retailer. Social media has become a, another essential way for consumers to connect. But uh, it, it's and this year, the first half of this year, more than half of consumers have already reported um, social media being the driver to get them into a physical store. And this year, holiday sales, they're predicting uh, an almost 10 times uh, holiday spending 
generated by social media rather than traditional marketing. So this is going to be the year of social media in terms of driving sales into stores and websites. And of course, digital and physical have become very entwined this year, more so than any other year. And now social media is the front door to a store rather than a website. Websites are becoming much less important for a retailer. And also because of video and influencer content on social media, consumers are looking to shop experiences and feelings rather than products. So retailers who can support a strong social media message with an equally strong in-store experience, they're going to have a much better chance of holding up to competition from companies like Timu and Shein and even Walmart's new online marketplace. Um, so those are some changes and trends that are really going to be impactful for the holiday season this year. Um, Mike, I was, how, how do you think these shopper journey changes are going to impact retailers and how they use data? Yeah, thanks, Deanne. Uh, I almost forgot to take off the mute button there um, and started talking without it. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of things to think about, particularly when you're trying to run uh, a large retail organization. You know, particularly, are your marketing dollars working as planned? Are the demographics behaving differently than anticipated? What's the lifetime value of different customer segments? You talked about a plan earlier. You talked about feelings. So there's a lot of different things that are in there. And one of the things that I think is important is understanding how to pivot if the plan isn't going the way you expected. And the only way you can really know that is to measure how your customers are viewing your plan. Are you Do you have the right inventory? Are your marketing messages driving the behavior that you're hoping for? And one of the things that we've done at Happy or Not is kind of channeled or made it a lot easier for customers to kind of explain to businesses how they're doing, how those things are impacting uh, or how their plan is impacting the organization. So for example, on the left, you'll see a chart um, showing the demographics. This is some information from a large airport uh, in the UK. And one of the things that they did is kind of changed up their entire way of people engaging with their staff. Whether you're, when you're ordering food, ordering drinks, you had to order everything through a kiosk or through a tablet. And what they were able to measure quickly was what the men and women felt about these changes. And what they identified is that for folks that were men in particular that were over 65, they really did not like this, uh, this kind of new way of transacting with the organization. So when they looked at the data and identified that challenge and identified what the problem was, they were able to pivot quickly, and make the changes necessary to make sure that those folks that were unhappy became happy and continued to be customers. Um, so Deanne, what are some of the trends that you see <clears throat> in improving the shopper revenue for the brick and mortar? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, it's it's hard for a retailer to do their own thing. If other retailers are offering discounts, you're probably going to have to as well, unless you're somebody like a Nike, for example. Um, if everyone's doing free shipping, you're probably going to have to do that also just to meet the baseline of what consumers have now been trained to expect. But there are some things you can do to make the most of the holidays. And really, one of the most impactful things is to hang on to as much profit margin as possible on the sales that you are getting. Uh, I mean, it's it's important to connect to your consumers on social media, <clears throat> e-commerce and online channels, but brick and mortar is your most uh, profit retaining asset. So anything you can do to incentivize customers to come into your store, to spend some quality time there, entice them to use click and collect instead of shipping to reduce your fulfillment costs. These are some things that, that are really going to maximize your profits significantly and also to set you up for repeat business in the coming next quarter. Um, you can also rethink your discount strategies. You can offer add-ons and services instead of straight out price reductions to try to defray some of that profit loss. But this only works if you really understand what services or benefits are going to be meaningful to your customer. So uh, having a great data strategy is really the only way to use the, the anti-discounting strategy, as I call it. Um, make sure your in-store experience is a good one. Offer things like free gift wrapping. I mean, these things sound small, but they really do bring shoppers into the store, which again, that's where you're going to make the most profit. 
And of course, make sure your frontline staff is well-versed in product information and that they're given the, the tools they need to connect shoppers in the store to things like endless aisle or home delivery or professional assembly services. I mean, remove any possible barriers to purchase right in the moment there of decision in your store. Uh, partnerships are another way. To, they're, they're a big benefit to retailers at any time of year, of course, but especially so at holiday time, uh, holiday time. So getting your products in front of more eyeballs can really help overcome that loss of vil visibility from having more shoppers use things like AI searches or going on new online marketplaces where you are going to be invisible to those, those shoppers. Um, think about shop and shops or pop-up stores. Uh, use complementary partner stores to, to help set up uh, a presence. Grocery stores, department stores, these all generally tend to have space that they would love to maximize by bringing in some, some ancillary um, partner products to, to fill out their stores and to connect more closely with customers. So these, um, and, and it sounds really basic. This one's a pet peeve of mine, but decorations, in-store decorations put shoppers in a holiday mood and a holiday mood is a gifting mood. Um, too many stores just do nothing anymore. It's, it's a burden, it's a cost. They're concerned about being politically correct, but there are um, non-denominational kind of decorations you can put in that, that really restore that, that um, holiday spirit. Because if you don't, then a shopper's really demotivated to come into a store. Might as well buy online because there's nothing different in the store this year. And it can be depressing. So, and, and also that holiday mood extends to your frontline staff too. Employees who feel appreciated and rewarded during the holidays are going to serve your customers much more uh, much better, but they're also going to feel more job satisfaction and hopefully reduce your turnover, which is going to improve your cost, your operational costs in the coming year. Um, so, um, Scott, um, there's another, um, uh, what is another crucial competitor to retail success and customer experience? Yeah, thank you so much, Deanne. You've done a great job setting the table for some of these points I'm about to make. And if you read the headline of this particular slide, it sounds really, really obvious, of course. So if you deliver a good experience for your customers, obviously that's going to lead to a revenue increase or theoretically it will. But let me also set the table with a couple of points related to some of the, the messages that Deanne has already shared. Um, based on some of the data we've researched and collected, over half of shoppers that purchase online actually go into a store to check out a product or a brand first. And then secondly, we've also learned and discovered that companies and retailers that have a strong omni-channel strategy in place have an incremental 80% increase in in-store activity over time. And again, as you see here, even the image we've used on this particular slide shows an in-store experience, but companies and retailers that are really investing in a strong omni-channel um, strategy often deliver a better in-store experience as a result of that. And it might go without saying, you can't improve something if you're not measuring it. So as Mike already alluded to himself, we bring to the table a strong solution, both on the digital world as well as the physical world to help retailers measure customer and shopper experiences. And obviously if you're paying attention to that and then making improvements as part of what you're learning, that will then yield the benefits that we share here. So of course, higher conversion rates. And as Deanne alluded to, inflation is a huge economic pressure that we're all facing. Of course, consumers are really facing that pressure as they're thinking about the gifts they're gonna buy over the holiday season, listening to them, gathering feedback from your customers and consumers, and then turning that into better pricing, better product availability. That of course is gonna to lead to higher conversion rates. And then some of these also fall directly in line. So if you're offering great experiences, offering the right pricing and uh, product offerings, that's gonna yield repeat business. 
Of course, that will yield increased customer loyalty. I think we're all accustomed to referring great retailers and, um, and companies if we ourselves have good experiences. That's another strong benefit. And then I think it's safe to say no business or industry is um, facing a lack of competition in the modern economy. So everyone is facing tight competition. And if you're delivering uh, exceptional experiences, that's a kind of horse gonna separate you from your competitors. So that's another strong benefit to consider. And to parlay this, we've got another great uh, customer case to share with you. So let's go ahead and move on to that. And I'm really, really happy to share this customer case because I myself am a huge sports fan and a huge consumer of sporting goods. So I'm really happy to share the XSL, XXL sporting goods story. So for those of you in the US market, you can think of this company um, in a similar light as Academy Sports or Dick's Sporting Goods. So similar offerings, of course, These, this company happens to be in the Nordic region in Europe. But as you can see here, um, they focused heavily on improving customer experience that led to a very strong rate of 94% customer satisfaction during the peak holiday shopping season. They've been using the Happy or Not solution for about three years now, and it's important to emphasize they're using it in both the digital space and in their physical stores. So going back to that omni-channel uh, point that I was making. And I would also emphasize to you, they're also using the Happy or Not solution to measure employee satisfaction, which is another really important point we'd like to make to you today. If you're measuring how satisfied your employees are in their jobs, in their day-to-day -day lives, that's gonna get, uh, of course, coming out in how they serve your customers and improve your customer satisfaction all in all. So it's a really overall high-level package um, employee satisfaction yields customer satisfaction, of course, yields higher revenue. Great story here to tell. And of course, if you'd like to learn more, this is highly detailed on our website. So please feel free to look at that if you're interested in learning more about this story. Thanks, Scott. Um, we now move on to the next section where Deanne shares her insights on the key challenges and opportunities in retail this season. Oh, thanks, Nima. There are some big challenges and opportunities ahead for retailers in the coming year, especially. Um, nothing is bigger, of course, than supply chain challenges. We have weather that's beginning to impact transportation. The Suez Canal is, is low. Hurricanes are impacting abilities, the ability for shipping um, um, ships to come into port. The political relationship with China is forcing many retailers to find new um, supply chain connections, which is, is something that's always usually a multi-year effort <laughs> to find them and train them and integrate them into your operations. Material scarcity is also causing retailers to have to kind of scramble to find new alternatives and even new products uh, substitutions. There is the challenge of outside events that are not in a retailer's control, things like the Hollywood writer's strike. Um, that has had an impact on product sales, especially this holiday season. There were movies that were supposed to be out already, Marvel movies, DC movies like Deadpool and Venom that are now being pushed to next year. So those products are not going to be available for sale this year. Um, managing customer expectations and customer worries is now becoming the purview of the retailer. So retailers are now having to find ways to help consumers, not just with selling products, but with the full life cycle of that product. So bringing in ways to recycle, ways to repurpose and return. This is now becoming part of a retailer's job and it's not something that they are experienced at. So that it's, a, it's a big learning curve, but they also, this also, leads to some big opportunities like the ability now through technology to connect with your consumers, not just across uh, media channels, but also lifestyle activities. So staying connected to your product as they travel, as they buy groceries, as they buy clothing, movies, especially going to the gym. Now you have a way to stay connected to your retailer in their day-to-day -day activities, not just as they go on social media. 
So if you look at things like the Barbie movie, um, there were a lot of product sales generated by people going to the Barbie movie. I think the sale of pink clothing went through the roof. And, and there are actual Barbie products now that are taking a huge surge because of that movie. And the Taylor Swift concert is coming to movie theaters. And they're going to create a big experience around that, that movie going um, event that are going to lead to significant product sales. And so experiential retail is really going to be one of the biggest opportunities for retailer next, starting next year. Uh, partnerships. Um, we've already talked a little bit about partnerships. I'm a big, big proponent of creating a retail ecosystem around you of partners to better serve your customer from end to end. But next year is going to really... Um, be elevated in terms of how you measure the success of those partnerships. Um, think of Target and Ulta or Walgreens and Birchbox. I mean, typically they each collect data on customers uh, in the stores buying their products, but they have not traditionally shared that data with each other. But this year through technology, again, the ability to consolidate and share that data across departments and across partners is going to really elevate the ability of each retailer to better serve the customer. And the last thing that I'm excited about is retail media networks. For the first time in a long while, retailers now have a way, a path to create a new revenue stream in their brick and mortar stores through retail media networks. Um, a lot of retailers next year is gonna be a challenge year for getting foundationally started on retail media because a lot of retailers still have spotty Wi-Fi, they don't have access to electricity on every aisle to bring digital screens into their stores, but they're gonna get that sorted out. And then they're gonna be able to show ads in their physical stores and start to consolidate shopper data across online and offline media channels, which is going to be a big opportunity to increase the quality and the amount of first party data that a retailer can gather. And that's going to create a very lucrative revenue stream at some point over the next couple of years. So next year is gonna be groundwork laying for this. And I think um, starting the year after, you're gonna to start to see some of that revenue come in. And that's really kind of the biggest challenges and opportunities I see coming that are going to impact retailers in the next six to 12 months. Thank you all. This has been very, very interesting. And it's now time to wrap up everything and hear Deanne, Scott's and Michael's final thoughts. I would just finalize things by just emphasizing you can't really replace the fundamentals of hearing directly from consumers. And I think you would all maybe agree, human psychology, we've got a lot going on in our daily lives. It's easy to forget something after we've experienced it. So it's really critical to capture something in the moment it actually happens. And if you do that effectively, you can really capture useful data and a high volume of data from your customers as they're going through your, your retail store, or your website, et cetera and get that true pulse of what's happening in your brand experience across your portfolio. And then allowing you to use that data to make changes to improve their experience overall. So at the end of the day, it's simple, but it's a very powerful message that uh, we're seeing a lot of great companies leverage in their businesses and turning that ultimately into improved revenue. And Mike, with that said, maybe you could share a specific example based on something you've you've heard from one of our customers recently. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like the word you used there a moment ago, pulse. Um, I kind of think of what we do as almost like a heart monitor. You have you know your surveys or your mystery shoppers that are kind of like an EKG. They're like that one moment in time. Um, and what we do is kind of like have a heart monitor on each location. So you can see all day, every day, exactly what your customers are feeling and exactly what your customers are experiencing within the environments of the brick and mortar. And also, as you mentioned, uh, in the omni-channel on, online and digital. You know, for example, we work with a very large convenience store chain out west, 
And they've been, we've been working with them for, I guess, two years. And they have about 40 stores up and running right now with our solution. They're monitoring the front of the store to um, understand the customer's experience with the, within the, um, the shopping environment, also managing the restrooms uh, with our smiley walls. And what they were able to find was about, of all 40 stores, if the stores kept their happy index above 90%, it meant about a two to two and a half percent uplift in total sales and total revenue, which translated to about forty thousand dollars per store. And those stores had about a thirty percent margin on that forty thousand. So you're talking about an extra twelve thousand at a minimum to the bottom line, which is about nine x their investment in our solution. So that you couldn't ask for a better investment, and you couldn't ask you know for a, a solution that's going to allow you to understand exactly where your customers are feeling all day every day. Um, happy or not does all of those things. That's a great example, Michael. Thank you. All right. Thank you to all of our wonderful speakers uh, today. Now is your chance to ask directly from all of these experts. So please write your questions to the chat and we'll get to them. Okay. <clears throat> One thing I guess I could add while we're while we're waiting for yeah. some questions, uh, Nilu, is you know, a lot of times people will ask me about, um, well, how much feedback am I going to get? And when I say hard monitor, I genuinely mean it. You know, for example, that convenience store chain that I mentioned that's only running 40 stores, they're getting about a half a million feedbacks a year. And you, that's all day, every day, just getting massive amounts of information uh, from customers in real time in the experience. And not only they're telling you the simple question, are they happy or are they not? They're also telling you what they were happy about, what they were not happy about. So you can kind of figure out what needs to change. And then now with the addition of the, the AI aspect with demographics, be able to see which areas uh, of your customer base you need to focus on improving, improving with. Great. We actually have one question in here. So this is for... Uh, Deanne, what do you view as the pivotal trends and challenges influencing retail in 2024? I think um, retail theft is going to be a major driver of how retailers run their businesses and the kinds of things they choose to do. I do see next year as a, a year of um, leveling off on that. It, it's been getting worse and worse and worse. Next year, you're going to start to see um, legislation kicking in to try and help those retailers a little bit more. I mean, the best way to prevent say uh, theft is to make it harder to resell those products. It worked for the, the pawn shop industry, and I think uh, now it has to work for online retailing sources. Um, if you look, look at companies like CVS, they... Uh, I think they recovered almost a billion dollars of stolen goods from just uh, one or two marketplace sites last year. So the government is going to have to step in and provide some serious regulation to make it harder to resell those goods. I think next year you're going to see that start to turn the tide a little bit. And in addition, technology is really going to start to converge online and offline channels so that you can really literally start shopping anywhere and everywhere. And you're going to see a lot more shopping done through artificial intelligence, the, the birth of things like your own personal um, butler, online butler, who's going to make recommendations for you and then take care of that business. And you're going to start to see your um, smart products interacting with you more and helping you make better decisions about your life. I know one of the things Ikea was looking at is um, a smart product that kind of communicates with you as if it's a person. Like, oh, the, you, you, bought, you bought me two years ago, but you haven't used me much and I'm so lonely and do you really need me or should I help you find a way to resell me to somebody who needs me more? That's the kind of thing that you're gonna start to see happen 
as it's driven through artificial intelligence next year. <laughs> That's it interesting. Could be creepy. <laughs> yeah. It could be, yeah. <laughs> um, great, thank you. Um, maybe for Scott and Michael. So there was the demographics feature. You you quickly talked about that, uh, Michael. How does it actually work and collect the data? And is the data anonymous? Good question. So with our Smiley Touch device, the camera is activated and it uses a facial recognition vector to identify the sex and age approximately of, of each individual that's giving feedback. Uh, it doesn't save the uh, image of the person. There's not an actual picture taken. Uh, so it is fully anonymous. Yeah. Great. And then we have one more question here. So does the feedback data, um, the happy or not solution captures uh, update in real time? Yes, um, all the information that's received as soon as somebody pushes a button, uh, you're able to view that within our dashboard or on the app. Great. Thank you. That's all for questions right now. Let's see, we have one more in the Q&A. Let's see what we have here. So, okay. How to increase sales on a traditional city with old population without being uncompetitive with big companies in terms of social networking? Great question. Well, I think that one is driven by the physical store. So the, the older population, I, I think it's... Um, it's a myth now that that baby boomers don't like technology. Uh, there, there are, of course, a certain percentage of them that, that don't like it. But now it's more about convenience. And convenience doesn't mean uh, speed. It means brain damage, less brain damage. So what is easier or um, what is faster? Those, those are not the same thing. And so making things as easy and intuitive as possible sometimes means the shop the shopping experience takes longer and so finding ways to 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 think that through in your store so instead of shoving um, self-service kiosks everywhere try to think about what you're trying to accomplish you're trying to optimize people to get them out the store as quickly as possible. So it's not a painful experience. That's the last experience that they have with your store. So it's important. So maybe it's one and a half people for, for your self-service instead of just asking the shopper to do everything. Maybe it is um, finding new ways to connect with a shopper. Uh, direct mail is starting to make a little bit of a comeback, not just for the older populations, but because it's something unique and it's it's a new way to to trigger a thought so that someone will go to social media and look you up and, and see what you're about. So that that is um, my my thoughts. It's a it's an interesting question. I think it would deserve a lot more thought than I just gave it. But <laughs> that's you did great. Thank you. All right. Thank you once more, uh, everyone, for joining today's session. We hope you enjoyed it. I definitely did. Very interesting, um, interesting things that were, were talked about here. Uh, you can get in touch with all of our speakers today. If you have any further questions, we're all happy to help. And you can find everyone's contact information from the material we'll be sending over after the weekend. Or if you're quick, you can also screenshot this slide right now. So thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day. Bye.